New revelations made public officially today for the first time over Israel's bombing of a Syrian nuclear reactor in September of 2007. What was truly at stake in that mission? What did it take to be successful? And what were the regional consequences and what lessons might it hold for policymakers in today's Middle East? Well, joining us in the studio was Reserve's Brigadier General Relic Shafir, whose long military career has seen several historic Israeli Air Force missions, including the 1981 attack on Iraq's nuclear reactor at Osric. And journalist Ronan Bergman, whose extensive reporting on Israel's covert security operations includes the recently published Rise and Kill First, the secret history of Israel's targeted assassinations. But first, let's Here's some of what then Air Force Chief Eliezer Shkedi told our reporter, Matthias Inbar, about the mission to destroy the new Syrian reactor. דיברנו על זה, שנכון שישראל תתקוף. ואני מכבד מאוד את האמירה שלו, כי היא מסתכלת על הדברים מהזווית היותר רחבה של מזרח תיכון בעולם בכלל, שהאמריקאים לא, מס... לא מסכימים שדבר כזה יהיה. אם המלצת לראש הממשלה ש... לתקוף לפני הפגישה עם בוש או אחרי? גם לפני וגם אחרי. <laughs> אבל הדברים היו מאוד מעניינים. אני גם חושב שלמדינת ישראל יש משמעות שהיא תוקפת בהיבט ההרתעה, ובזה שמבינים, כשאנחנו צריכים לעשות משהו להגן על המדינה שלנו ועל העם שלנו, אנחנו עושים. הם תקפו, וזו הרגשת שמחה גדולה. מצד שני, הדבר הראשון שמיד ראית גם, שמיד אנחנו מחזירים את כולם לזה, לכוננות מלאה ולהמשיך להסתכל, לא נגמר עד שלא נגמר. הכי פשוט. נגמר רק כשהמטוסים נחתו, והכול בסדר. אני אפילו לא יצאתי ולא דיברתי עם אף אחד עד אחרי שהמטוסים התרחקו למקום שהרגשתי שזה כבר בסדר, ורק אז יצאתי מתא השליטה ופגשתי את ראש הממשלה. Here with us, Brigadier General Relic Shafir, but let's start with journalist Ronan Bergman. Ronan, this day in 2007, this intelligence was a massive coup for Israel, and one of the most secretive parts really of a secret story was how Israel, how the Mossad came upon that intelligence. What can you tell us about how that unfolded? Well, Norit, um, first, hello, and uh, always a pleasure to be at your show. Uh, and Kalev, of course, uh, hi to you, and good, good evening. Um, the, we are still under strict orders from censorship not to discuss Uh, some of the details, uh, many, of the de- many of them are about Mossad uh, involvement in this story. What I can say, and this is also uh, with some reliance on non-Israeli sources, is that the Mossad was able to obtain the one piece of reliable information that proved that the Syrians and North Koreans are involved in a joint nuclear effort in Deir Azur, thanks to a daring operation uh, against one uh, Syrian nuclear scientist in Vienna just a few months before the raid on the, on the reactors. In the years before, between 2004 and early 2007, both the CIA and other uh, entities of American intelligence and Israeli military intelligence and Mossad flagged that specific site as being suspected and also had some hints and some fragments of information that the relations between Syria and North Korea are not just in relevance to missile, but also might have some nuclear angle. There was a, an officer in military intelligence who said, I think that they are trying to build a bomb in Syria in the same way that they built the nuclear bomb in North Korea, in Yonbyang. But this was, there was no proof. The proof was obtained in the form of pictures that were stolen from Ibrahim Otman, the chief of the Syrian nuclear energy uh, organization in, when he traveled to, to Vienna. These pictures that were later given by the CIA to Congress 
in order to prove that North Korea is the major horrified uh, evil proliferate of the world, they were, these were ground photographs of the reactor. And they left no place for imagination. And with them, Israel could uh, approach the US and say, look, the North Korean are building a nuclear plutogenic reactor in Syria. And the meaning of that is, can be only one. No research, no nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. Syria is building the A-bomb. Relic, from your own personal experience, of course, on such missions, just how risky was that bombing raid there to Syria and the return of those Israeli jets? Um, the area itself was a secluded area, uh, which is in the eastern part of Syria, quite far but not a problem for uh, the airplanes who had enough fuel to light her around. Uh, the area was not guarded by missiles, anti-aircraft missiles, and so the passage in and out um, was not particularly dangerous, and the attack itself as well. So as far as endangering the airplanes, it was not a very risky mission, except that they're flying in, in uh, uh, enemy territory, uh, and anything can happen. So that was uh, one point. The other point was how do you assure the destruction of the nuclear site without creating a lot of com collateral damage and without uh, making too much of an impact that would result in the Syrians having to do something about it. So uh, I think the success of the mission was that it had the right blend of enough firepower to destroy, but not enough to cause the Syrians to have to react. And that was the real success. Relic, just how uh, common or not is a situation like that where it's such a fine line where Israel would have the capability to take out a nuclear reactor? Well, of course, it depends on the target, the, uh, how well it's guarded, whether there are missiles around, and uh, whether you need to uh, drop a lot of bombs in order to reach the what we call the heavy water or, or the uh, the area that you want to take out. And above ground or underground? It's, it's always guarded in some way below ground. Uh, but in this particular case, um, you make an assumption based on the knowledge of how this place was built. And there you plan how much munition you need to drop, how many airplanes, how long will it will take you to go in do the mission and come back. So it really is different in uh, every case. So we can't draw from one case to the next. All right, well, we are gonna pause for just a moment there because that is exactly what I think Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is hinting at a little bit today when he used the opportunity of these revelations to say Israel is always prepared to stop its enemies from getting nuclear weapons. So what does that event in 2007 actually mean for us today for the very different modern Middle East? The conversation continues with Brigadier General Relik Shafir and Ronan Bergman when we're back. Don't go anywhere. back here on the rundown continuing the conversation with a closer look at those new revelations of Israel's 2007 attack on Bashar al-Assad's secret nuclear reactor. Before we continue, let's look at another clip from our interview with the man who was at the helm of the Air Force back then, Eliezer Shkedi, here relating to the Syrian bombing to carrying out a similar strike against Iran. <laughs> הסוגיה העיראקית שהייתה עמדה בפני עצמה. אף אחד מהמקרים האלה לא דומה לשני. כל אחד עומד בפני עצמו. בכל מצב, נכון לשקול את הדברים בחוכמה, בעומק, באחריות רבה, ולחשוב מה צריך לעשות בהתמודדות. Well, still with us in the studio is Brigadier General in the Reserves, Relic Shafir. And, but first now, let's go back to journalist Ronan Bergman. And Ronan, I wonder how much of the timing of the release of this information could possibly be connected with Israel sending a message out to the world about Iran, even as it's telling the world to toughen uh, or fix or nix that, that nuclear agreement or reminder what happens when Israel feels it's threatened by a nuclear power. Well, um, if you ask military censorship, they will say there's no 
connection to current events, and if there is, then the connection only yield to further delays, because censorship have alerted the Israeli media back in October that they are just about to lift the ban from the publication of the raid on um, the Syrian reactor, and that has been kept delaying because of further tensions between Israel, Hezbollah, the Russian, the Syrians, and Iran uh, in the north of, uh, of Israel. So um, I think that you cannot, while saying that, you cannot ignore the current events. And it's mainly not about the Iranian nuclear side, but the Iranian deployment in Syria, because a parallel line can be drawn. History does not repeat itself, but it's sometimes quite similar. Uh, 11 years ago, Israel appealed to the United States please take out the nuclear reactor and give us an example of how committed are you to the safety and security of Israel. And while being on a very friendly uh, relations between uh, President Bush and Prime Minister Olmert, the U.S. declined and did not do that and did not fulfill Israeli uh, request. Today, nowadays, Israel appealed to the United States, please exercise much pressure on Russia so Russia will make sure that the Iranians do not continue to deploy in Syria and create a viable danger, strategic danger, to Israel and another front in addition to the one uh, with, with Lebanon. So again, Israel asked the U.S. to um, fulfill its commitment to its security and was declined. And I think that if there's a message in the publication of what happened 11 years ago, the message is once you leave Israel alone, once you do not support Israel, once you do not, meaning the U.S. doesn't activate very, um, I would say, hardcore diplomacy in order to reach uh, some sort of a goal in Syria, Israel takes the initiative well, and um, is willing to go to a very, very aggressive actions in Syria. I, I want to follow up on that with you, Relic, because uh, that message was sent to the United States uh, back, uh, back then, over 11 years ago. But... Syria of 2007, I imagine, is not very similar to Iran of 2018. Definitely not. Um, I think it could be taken into context that the question that we had asked the U.S. Uh, is a little more complex. It's like playing a little game of chess, where we ask them to do it so that if they decline and we do it, then we'll get their quiet support. So it's a, it's a kind of a, uh, uh, a request for action through a uh, kind of a Tai Chi maneuver rather than a karate maneuver. So uh, um, we, I don't think we expected the U.S. to do the job, except for the fact that if, if uh, a war breaks out, certainly an attack by the U.S. will not invoke a war, uh, whereas our attack, there is some danger. But it was not really a question, please do it, but more, we're going to do it, and that's the way we're asking for your permission. Um, but this how is possible would it be? I mean, let's talk technical details. Uh, obviously, we can't get into all the details, but in terms of Israel's capability, in terms of an air force You're actually being about able Iran. to... Iran. Iran, sure, okay. 2018. The Iranian uh, program uh, had learned from uh, the, the Iraqi raid in 81, <clears throat> And they have dispersed their uh, um, assets and hid them underground under very heavy fortifications in such a manner that it would be more difficult to uh, render them unusable. And so it would take uh, a lot of power and probably some combination of uh, um, a s very strong air forces to do the job over quite a while. That does not mean that Israel cannot uh, strike Iran and cause damage. But in order to take it out, it needs, uh, 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 I think, a lot more. And collaboration. So I think if we pose some kind of a uh, threat to Iran and show them that we're willing to um, take action, even though it's very far, and even though they've fortified uh, uh, the place, um, we're trying to amass help from the Europeans and from the U.S. into pressuring Iran and putting um, uh, a blunt uh, threat, either by a blockade, sanctions, or military action. And we are part of a larger game 
right. than ourselves. Well, Ronan, I want to ask you in the minute we have left, you spoke to a former head of the CIA, Michael Hayden, about those moments, about that decision before 2007. What did he share with you in that conversation he had with the former Mossad chief, Meir Dagan? Well, they had few of them, but two of them are the most important. The first one is that incident when in February, uh, Mayor Dagan came to his office and presented him with the same pictures that were taken from Ibrahim Motman, the, uh, the Syrian scientist, and said that the, the North Korean are building a nuclear plutogenic reactor in Syria and asked the U.S. to help Israel with corroborating the information and possibly striking the, the, the site. This is a very dramatic moment with, that led to a lot of other actions. The other um, conversation, which Hayden called one of the most candid conversation they had, which is a diplomatic way to say they had uh, serious disagreement, was when Hayden said, if either you or us bomb the site, my analysts, who are very conservative, are sure that President Assad would not give up on his damaged ego and pride, and feeling humiliated, he will go to an all-out war with Syria with Israel, right. while Mayor Dagan said, I, th I think that the, the, the contrary, I think that he will not do that as long as we maintain that secret. And, and we in see, retrospect, uh, Michael Hayden said, in retrospect, we, we were wrong right and, and Mayor Dagan was right. Ronan Bergman, Brigadier General Relic Shafir.